Welcome back. You know, quite a number of months ago I did a two-part video series on the setup and operation of the Lee Loadmaster, uh, and at the time I was demonstrating with the 45 ACP. Well, since then I've had quite a number of requests to do uh, a video on how rifle cartridges uh, are done, most notably the 223 Remington, because that's one that people go through in great volume, and uh, this, is, this is the sort of press which is ideally set up for that. And I've used this press extensively uh, to load uh, 223 Remington. It's a it's a fairly small case. Uh, the leverage is the leverage is more than ample uh, to uh, deal with 223. And I've and I've got no qualms whatsoever if I were to do such a case as a 308 and perhaps even a 306. Although you know you you're talking about you're talking about uh, certainly adding uh, adding more. Uh, exertion, more effort to your own, uh, to your own work, but uh, the 223 is certainly a very, very nicely handled case. What I'm going to do, though, is not just demonstrate the uh, loadmaster. I want to demonstrate the entire process of uh, setting up uh, and preparing the uh, cases ahead of time, getting them ready, making sure that they're properly inspected, and so forth. So let's dive right into it, and we'll get going. Now certain things are absolutely essential uh, to the reloading process. The very first thing that you really want to do is uh, sort through all your cases. Now, <clears throat> when I say sort through your cases, first of all, uh, cull out any military cases and be sure that you uh, keep those separate. They have to be, they have to be decapped. Uh, in other words, separately, the old primer has to be uh, forcefully uh, pushed out. I recommend using a uh, separate, uh, just a universal decapping die, which allows you to just uh, go through all your cases and decap those military uh, crimped primers. And that's the, that's the reason, is because those primers, uh, they... They have, some people improperly call them staked primers. That's an that's improper usage. Staked means a, literally, it comes from the term of using a machinist uh, stake, a staking tool, which is a, uh, like a prick punch with a, a chisel end on it. And that's not the type of process which is used by uh, military cases uh, when they're formed. They use a, a circular, they use a circular tool which uh, is basically driven around the primer and crimps that primer in place. It's done that way uh, simply to ensure that the primers don't back out during uh, during uh, forceful uh, operation, you know, full automatic fire and things like that. And also because uh, the pressure levels of over 62,000 uh, psi in a military case can uh, sometimes blow primers if they're not uh, crimped in, pr in place. Well, you cannot reseat a new primer with a uh, previously crimped primer pocket. You absolutely must use a uh, some sort of a swaging tool or a cutting tool which uh, basically bells the mouth of that primer pocket. Now I've used, uh, I've, I've used virtually every type of process uh, on the planet when it comes to that. I've used the, I've used the reamers, I've used uh, hand swaging tools, all sorts of things. And to be very honest with you, the only one that really works uh, if you're doing more than a few cases is the Dillon, uh, the Dillon swaging machine. And I'll show you what that looks like. This is the Dillon swager. Now I know that there's probably another uh, couple of uh, companies out there that uh, make similar devices now. I can't I can't speak for them because I haven't used them, but I know that this one works and this is very popular uh, in the uh, marketplace for doing just this work. Um, this this particular case here happens to be a general dynamics case which was made for the military but never made it to uh, a loaded uh, status. So the the uh, primer pocket was actually never crimped. These were a terrific bargain that I bought uh, a bunch of uh, some time ago military quality cases without a crimp on it. It's very, very rare. But the way this is the way this is done after the case has been decapped is it's simply uh, placed onto the uh, proper rod. Now there's two different size rods, one for uh, large primers and one for small primers. And it's simply dropped into place and then this this handle uh, is, is pushed down and that 
basically pushes a plug into that primer pocket and rolls over the edge and uh, irons out. That's, in other words, swages it. It reforms the brass and irons out the uh, edge of the primer pocket so that it can easily re receive a new uh, primer. Now I must caution you that quite a number of military uh, cases that have been decapped and swaged, you may find, uh, I have found as many as uh, 10 to 20 or 30 percent of uh, different batches that uh, are, are really too loose to receive a primer uh, suitably snug. In fact, some of them have actually, the primers will actually just simply fall out uh, during, during cycling in a gun. So you really have to be very watchful of that. There's a device that I recommend and I use, which is a simple go, no-go gauge, which uh, I obtained. You can, you can look this up online. Uh, there's a private individual that makes these uh, little gauges here. Plug gauge is what it is, but you know you can get plug gauges, but you generally have to pay a, a fortune for a, a set of them. Whereas this one here is just made for go and no go. So you can simply insert it into the uh, primer pocket and it should be snug on one side and it should not be received on the other. The, this, this side here ensures that the primer pocket is still nice and tight if it doesn't go into that side. But it should, it should fit it should fit into the go side uh, somewhat snugly. And, that, and that's a very handy tool to have so that you don't end up with a bunch of uh, uselessly primed cases that uh, have no uh, function whatsoever or can actually be uh, hazardous to use. So a go, no-go gauge, uh, something that's very handy to have. Now, the other thing you want to do is make sure you run them through either a snap gauge, uh, which is simply Lyman has made a snap gauge for many years, and it's, and it's a size for uh, most, almost all popular cases, uh, but you just simply can run the case into that uh, notch that says 223 Remington, and as long as it fits that, as long as it fits that opening, you're good to go. You don't have to, you don't have to trim your cases every single time. You can just simply run them through this a relatively inexpensive and handy snap gauge that's set up for all your different calibers. Or you can simply use, all right, you can set up your uh, calipers, which are, an, that's an essential tool anyway, but you can set up your cal calipers to the uh, correct size and use that as a snap gauge. The only thing is that I, I prefer not to, this is a precision tool, so I prefer not to be uh, exercising this, you know, for, for mundane projects like that because, you know, it does, it does subject the thing to, uh, you know, potential for dropping it and things like that and, and ruining a very expensive instrument. So rather than subjecting that to the possibility of damage, I just use this, I just use this snap gauge and it's as simple as that. And there are other, there are other dedicated snap gauges. Now if you find cases which are uh, too long that don't feed into that snap gauge, you've got to have a, a trimmer. Now, I use a bench trimmer. I know that that's probably a very laborious thing for the average person to use a bench trimmer, which is a hand crank. Well, I do also uh, simply take off the, I take off the hand crank and I can put on a battery operated uh, electric drill on it. And I can, I can simply uh, motorize this thing. I can, I can do many, many cases by simply motorizing the uh, spindle and it's a very very I like the Forster I've mentioned it before it's got a brown and sharp style uh, chuck in it and that brown and sharp chuck will fit virtually every standard case there is 3006 308 all your standard uh, 222 size uh, case heads which includes the 223 and all that and uh, so it's a really handy thing and if you need to have if you need to have an unusual size uh, chuck uh, they're, they're available uh, and at a fairly reasonable cost. You, you have to have a pilot for your, your your bullet dimension so this one is a 224 pilot and uh, you can you can very very easily go through an awful lot of cases and trim them. Let me just give a demonstration on how this works. I've got a few cases here which didn't pass muster. Uh, I culled through all these cases and I culled these out. Now it's been asked of me uh, is it appropriate to, uh, is it best to trim them first or to size them first and so forth and you know it, it it's, this is not like putting your socks on over your shoes. It really doesn't make any difference. 
Um, if you, you know, it, it's whatever, whatever happens to be easiest at the time for whatever you set up to do. So uh, it doesn't make any difference. Um, they don't stretch, they don't stretch that much, they're not subject to that much stretching during the uh, sizing process. If you use a Lee sizing die, it's got a long taper on the, uh, on the uh, neck sizing plug. That, that neck sizing, uh, that neck sizing uh, plug inside uh, is far more gentle than some of the buttons that are used by many of the other manufacturers that basically haul on that um, and, stretch, and stretch the neck considerably. But uh, they, instead it's got a very long taper, very gentle, and I have found that there's no stretch whatsoever. So anyway, let me uh, show you quickly how you uh, go through the process of trimming these down to size. Now I've said this before and I'll say it again. It's very important, I think it's, a, it's an essential thing to have a, a reputable loading manual. This one here happens to be the uh, Lyman. There are so many manuals out there that are, that are good. I like this one because sometimes it's just a, a quick reference for certain things such as your, uh, it, it, gives your, it gives your specifications for your cartridge up here. Uh, and this is um, right here, it shows the cartridge length as being uh, 1.760. That would be your maximum length and that would correspond to that uh, trim gauge that you have there, that snap gauge. But down here it says trim to length, which is 1.750. Now there's a rule of thumb which applies to all cartridges. If it doesn't give you a trim length, just simply subtract 10 thousandths from whichever the maximum, the maximum case length is, and that's your automatic trim length. It doesn't vary from uh, one cartridge to another, regardless of whether it's a 3006 or a 222. It's the same thing. It's always 10 thousandths less for your trim length. And should you go a little bit less than 10 thousandths, it's not going to, you know, you don't have to throw away the case. It's not the end of the world. Uh, they'll, they'll eventually grow back to a specification. Just set that one aside for planking, that's all, and don't, don't necessarily use it for your uh, competitive stuff. So what, I, what I've done ahead of time is I've set up my uh, Forster uh, to be the correct uh, trim length, and I'll just simply chuck these uh, cases in one at a time, and I, I can run through them very quickly. Usually it takes no more than uh, just a half a dozen turns. These knives are very sharp. They stay sharp forever. Uh, and I'm not going to bore you with the whole uh, process here. This gives, you a, this gives you an idea of how easy it is. Uh, and then after you've, after you've completed trimming them all, and as I say, you can use a, you can use a drill. It's fine. Uh, but, uh, and run the drill at slow speed. Don't, don't be running it at high speed because you don't want to be heating up your uh, spindle here. This is an expensive machine. It doesn't take any speed to do it. Um, and with with a standard with a with a standard chamfering tool and deburring tool, uh, just very very lightly, just scuff the inside and then scuff the outside. That's all you do. Do not keep on reaming and reaming and reaming. You don't want to create a knife edge there. All you're trying to do is remove the burr on the outside and on the inside you want to slightly bevel it. Now I'm not too fond of, I know that, I know that some people are using the very sharp long angle um, inside chamfering tools. I'm not fond of that unless there's an absolute necessity. If you're loading flat-based bullets, which uh, can be, sometimes flat-based bullets can be a little bit uh, cumbersome to load and they, they can sometimes hang up on the edge of the brass uh, with, especially with smaller calibers. Then I would maybe, uh, you know, suggest using a, a, a long angled uh, chamfering tool. But you don't want to be, you don't want to be cutting brass off unnecessarily on these cases because when you create a long angle, uh, you're reducing the, you're reducing neck contact on the bullet. You don't want to do that. Uh, this, the, the slightest amount of chamfering is, is necessary, especially for uh, boat tail bullets. All you're simply doing is removing, is removing the burr on the uh, outside and lightly, very lightly, belling the inside. If you can see how that is, if the light's reflecting off on that, that's all this, that's all that's necessary. Very, very light scuffing. Just like that and like that. 
So all my cases are done. I've got plenty to get me going. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be shooting some uh, service rifle uh, matches soon. So um, I've had people ask me how long these uh, tools last. Well, I bought this one in 1972. So uh, do it by your own by your own calculation. You can figure out how long that's been around. This is still this is still absolutely sharp. It cuts it cuts brass as clean and as uh, neatly as it did the, from the first day. And you know what? I've actually I've actually chamfered rechamfered the crown on a few rifle barrels with that. It does a nice job. Use a little bit of little bit of cutting oil. Nice if you got a if you got a chip in your barrel, you can use a little bit of cutting oil and run that in the barrel. And do it do it very gingerly, uh, just enough to just enough to cut a new edge, and you'd be very surprised. You can save yourself a fifty dollar uh, recrowning job. You know it's not gonna it's not gonna do it's not gonna do what a uh, you know a lathe will do, but I can guarantee you that I've had some extremely good results just by using that. And that's how hard that steel is. This one happens to be made by uh, L. E. Wilson. It was made for R. C. B. S. So that's a long time, and, and it's gone through uh, some uh, serious use. This is absolutely essential. You have to lubricate cases before you can uh, run them through a sizing die. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm doing straight wall cases, you can use a, uh, such as 45 ACP, uh, 9 millimeter, 38 special, 45, 70, and things like that. You can get a, a carbide die, which eliminates the need. It's a straight wall, so it's a carbide ring that simply runs down the side of the case and sizes it without the need for lubrication. But all of the cases must be, absolutely must be lubricated. Now, I did a separate video on the process that I use on lubrication and some of the hocus pocus that goes on. But having, uh, having all that aside, the one that I find that works absolutely the best and is by far the cheapest, it's the least, it's, it's the least messy, it doesn't create any residual stuff. I don't have to have a towel out here or anything like that to collect the, the mess. Uh, I just use this stuff here. This ca this tube uh, has been around an awful long time. I've used this particular tube now for close to two years, um, and I still have. Well, let's see. I still have probably 30% of that tube left because I use very very little. If you really want to know what this stuff is, it's Illoform PS700 paste. You can buy this in five gallon tubs or 55 gallon drums. This is what's used in the industry for just the process of forming metal. This is what it's made for, is for forming brass, forming steel, and things like that, automotive body panels. So uh, this is this is why I like it, because it's 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 efficient, it's made for the job, uh, and it you can use it wet or dry. I prefer to simply uh, put a small dollop in the bottom of my bucket here, maybe maybe two small dollops. I'm gonna be running about a hundred uh, a little over 100 cases in in this right now, and you can see how little that is. We're talking about we're talking about less altogether than probably a quarter teaspoon. So I'll toss those. In. And remember, you can always add more. What you're looking for is simply uh, a hazy appearance on the outside. Now, if this this bucket is not a new bucket, I I've, I've been using this same bucket right along. Uh, all I do is I I, I tumble them. Uh, by hand in this, I can do up to 200 cases in this same tub. But I do I do my cases in this, and then when I'm all done, uh, after the after the, every case has been uh, completely reloaded uh, with the bullets and primers in it, I bring it up to the kitchen and I put a few drops of Dawn dish detergent in it with some warm water, and I wash them out, and the and the box is back to being uh, absolutely. Sp sparkling clean again and I can just simply uh, toss my toss my uh, ammo on a uh, bath towel and dry them off and you know ammunition is waterproof you don't have to do anything special to make ammunition waterproof it's just waterproof because it's all tight brass fittings just like plumbing fittings so this is going to make some noise the microphone will probably go crazy so see how it goes. Now I'm looking for a, I'm looking for a light haze on all the cases. Well that's what I got. I don't need to have a lot of lubrication. Uh, that, those 
two little tiny dollops was more than sufficient to do all those cases without having them all greasy and uh, and everything. And uh, you know they're easy to handle. Uh, it's a it's kind of a waxy feel to it, and yet it's not it's not wax. It's a uh, it's a complete water it's a water soluble formula, so that it'll it'll wash off very easily. So let's move over to uh, the next step, which is the press. Now, if you watched my previous demonstration with the uh, Loadmaster, I was using this uh, familiar device here. This is the uh, disc measure. Now, the, 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 the single and double disc measure uses uh, basically pre-measured holes. There, there are a series of these discs that you can uh, select for particular specific charge weights. Now, however, that certainly leaves a little bit to be desired when you're working with uh, finite uh, differences that you want to um, have for, for particular cartridges for accuracy load. So I've got this auto drum measure which is now adapted to the uh, Loadmaster for this particular function for when I'm doing rifle cases. I still prefer to use the, uh, the disc measure for uh, loading a lot of pistol cases because uh, you know th that that cavity is once I know which cavity to use I take I take note of it and keep records I just go back to it and I don't have to I don't have to set this uh, I, this one here has to be set and you have to uh, measure your uh, weigh your charges whereas this one here once you've recorded it it's it's set and nailed down it's good to go of course you always verify a charge before you uh, actually uh, continue to load it because there can be variations in the bulk uh, and measure of certain powders according to their uh, specific lot. Because powder lots, just like paint lots and everything else, will vary from one to the other. And one of the variations is in its bulk factor. So weight and volume are not uh, necessarily uh, consistent. So now I've got this loaded with, uh, I've, I've i uh, got a good charge of Varget that I have uh, developed and uh, it's ready to go. Now this is not the machine. I don't, I don't recommend that anybody have only a Loadmaster. You still need to have a, a single station press or perhaps a, a turret press in order to uh, do load development. This is a very, very cumbersome machine for doing any kind of load development. This is set up for progressive loading. When you, once you've got your load established and you know what your charge weights are and your primers and all that stuff, you can just keep right on going with this. But make sure you have a, uh, make sure you have a good uh, press uh, that you can use for working up your loads uh, beforehand. Uh, this is a case actuated um, charging drum. So it will only drop powder when a case pushes on the inside of that die and uh, pushes up on the plunger which releases the charge. So you don't have to worry about uh, not having a case underneath it. It won't, it won't drop powder uh, simply because you're actuating the handle. We're going to go around the whole process and show you how simple it is. It's, there's nothing to it. It's a, it's a very, very good machine. I recommend that you watch the other video that gives all the specific details about how to set it up. So I'm just going to uh, go kind of uh, speedily through uh, the entire process. Now my dies are set up ahead of time on each of the stations and I refer you back to that other video to show you how uh, to set your uh, dies uh, and adjust them. Uh, but the, the dies are set up, uh, the powder measure is set up. Now I've got my primer tray filled with uh, small rifle primers. Um, one of the things that uh, I will not be using is the uh, automatic case feeder. In other words, the, the, the gang of tubes which is attached to this device which lowers a case onto the uh, feeder, uh, onto the feeder bar here. That, it really, uh, I, I know that people have made some successful uh, case feeders for this and adapted different things, but I don't really find it to be that much of a chore. What I do is I simply leave the, I, I leave the pusher, uh, that feeder, on the, uh, on the bar, and that actually provides a, a nice way of uh, just pushing it right into the uh, shell holder. Uh, with with accuracy, so we'll pull that down, and that will push that case in. And you notice that the pusher moves back. Now, I just resized that case and uh, decapped it with the uh, first station, and now it's going to push to the next station. I'll just simply drop another case on that bar and 
push that one down. Now this time it's priming the, sec the first case and it's sizing and decapping at the station one. And you notice that there's no, absolutely no uh, exertion involved whatsoever. These cases are very small. Uh, they, they, they go rapidly around. In this operation, I'm going to be seating a uh, bullet with the bullet seating die. Uh, however, it's also, if you watch now, it's going to, uh, the case behind it is going to move that powder measure and it's going to dispense a charge. And give it, give it just a second. You don't have to uh, give it too long, but just give it a second so that that uh, will dispense the correct amount of powder because the, you know, the, it has to go through a couple of orifices here and the powder is not a, it's not a ball powder, it's a, it's a extruded powder. So it can uh, be a little bit slower uh, traveling Obviously. down. That, that bullet is nowhere near uh, being uh, in as far as it needs to be. So I've turned the die stem down and we'll give it another shot. Just simply remove it from that, uh, from that last station before you crimp the uh, case. The last the last station is the factory crimp die, which applies a crimp. So you want to be able to run it through your uh, seating die again. That's a very simple process. We've already got the primer with powder charged and everything. So we'll just simply uh, work on that until we get the uh, bullet seated to the correct depth. We'll give it another try. We're progressively seating that and checking the overall length. I've got a witness mark uh, on the top of this, just a sharpie pen, just so I know how far I'm turning it. So I'll give it, I'll give it basically uh, from 11 to uh, 1 on the dial, and try that. We're almost there. We're, we've almost achieved our final measurement. So uh, just a tiny bit more, 2.262. Right there, I've got 2.260, 2.261, that's fine. And we'll run the other cases just to match them up. Now, now that I know that I have that particular case set, I can simply advance it to the next station and that will put my crimp on it. And I'll explain what the crimp is in a second. Now, right now we're not doing, we're not doing full progressive, but we're simply completing the setup of that bullet seating die. You're looking down inside the uh, Lee factory crimp die and it's exactly what it, uh, the name implies. Uh, this places a factory crimp on a case which does not require a cantaloured bullet, in other words a bullet with a uh, band embossed around the edge of the side of the bullet to receive a crimp. Uh, any bullet whatsoever uh, can be uh, factory crimped just as a factory bullet is without a cantaloupe because it, and it literally embosses the case uh, around the bullet and uh, pushes it in. As the, uh, as the case, as the shell plate uh, is pressed up against this uh, die, it forces those four uh, segments, uh, it's a collet, and it forces those four segments up, uh, squeezes those four fingers around the case and uh, rather than shoving the case up into a roll crimp and it affects the process very very nicely so you can put as uh, you can put as much or as little uh, crimp on the case as you want I've got just a moderate amount of crimp that's uh, necessary to retain the bullets during cycling in my AR-15 service rifle but uh, that's not the, that's not uh, too much uh, that's going to be uh, stressing out my brass and causing uh, problems with brittleness that's going to have to be resolved with uh, annealing. So just a little bit, I, I have those closing uh, probably about two-thirds of the way, and it's a very simple adjustment to make. Now I've seen gauges on the market, go and no-go gauges that uh, are designed and sold uh, to a gullible public to uh, determine whether or not their loaded ammunition is... Uh, going to be functioning properly and uh, well I got news for you there's no way that it could not function properly if you've got a good uh, die that has not been altered unless you grind the bottom of this die off or unless you uh, don't 
uh, do your sizing operation the way you ought to be doing it, uh, you're going to have a loaded round. You're going to have a loadable round. You don't need to have a go and no-go gauge. As far as the, uh, it, the, the die is your go and no-go gauge built in. When you've, when you've run a case into this, you've sized it to dimension. That's the way the die is designed. Um, and when you see the bullet, you're with, especially with an AR-15, your primary consideration is this right here. This is your gauge. This is your go gauge. If it fits into this magazine, you're good to go. And that's all there is to it. You don't have to have any special, you don't have to have any special indicator to tell you that uh, your ammo is fitting into your magazine. If it fits into the magazine, it's going to fit into your chamber. Absolutely. Because all your chambers are going to be uh, cut to dimension so that uh, they will accommodate whatever length that you can get out of that magazine. That's just the way it goes. Okay, so we're going to go through we're going to go through a process of loading a few now. <laughs> as we as we move through this, all I need to do is simply see the bullet on top of uh, the case on that station, uh, see the case on the uh, feeder arm. So let's keep going. I'm not interested in speed. I'm interested in uh, you know accuracy and making sure that I go with all deliberate speed, you might say. You can build up yourself a tempo as time goes on. Every single time that you see the bullet, get into the habit of looking into that case and making sure that you uh, see your powder there. Because, you know, powder, especially extruded powders, can bridge and they can hang up in this, uh, the uh, powder measure. So. As long as you can see powder, and you'll know just by looking at it, uh, that it's the uh, standard height, uh, you're good to go. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and tell your friends about us. God bless.